Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 292nd episode of Real Hawk Talk. I am Brian Nemhauser. You can find me on Twitter at HawkBlogger, and we're back, folks. It doesn't matter how many games in a row the Seahawks lose. It doesn't matter how crappy they, they look. It doesn't matter how bad the refs are. We are going to be here, and we are going to talk Seahawks every week, multiple times a week through the rest of this season and during the offseason. So, uh we've got another game in this gauntlet ahead we're gonna be talking about that tonight as the 49ers are gonna host the seahawks uh i am gonna hand it over to our host of the evening who is gonna be dana o'gorman before i do i just want to welcome in nathan ernst at nathan e11 uh jeff simmons at real jeff simmons and dana as i was saying before the show I'm on the road here in New York in a hotel room with absolutely crap lighting. My sound's probably bad. (laughs) Um, Jeff and Nathan also have some pretty like fluorescent office space kind of lighting going on. It feels like this kind of a bleak background to what has turned into a a bleak part of the season. So I'm very happy that you've returned to add a little, a lot, a little brightness to the, to the conversation. How are you doing? I am doing well. Yes, I had a fantastic week. I know no one else did, but I had a great week. So I come back on, you know, in pretty high spirits. But I will say that I want to say this first. I know that people are going to get real sick of me real quick because I'm not near as down in the dumps as everybody else. But, you know, there has to be a counterbalance, right? There has to be someone to to do that. So I'm happy to do that. Brian, I'm sorry that you're not feeling super good. And I'm sorry about having to be stuck in New York in a hotel room. Um, And so, yeah, I'm happy to to take this on. So first and foremost, though, I think that what would be good... (laughs) Good to talk about is let's go ahead and talk about this Cowboys game. I know it's been almost a week, right? Like, and I know you guys did a post game and I know we've had, but I think time sometimes is a good, you know, definitive, you know, way to, to really, truly look at a game. So subtracting the score, ignore the, the final score of this game. What were your impressions of how Seattle played. Jeff, I want to start with you because I think that I've watched this game twice now, even though I didn't watch it live. And the second time I watched it, I was actually, I was, I was pretty okay with the way they played. Yeah. I picked them to lose. I think it was 35 to seven on the show we had before last week. (laughs) So I thought they were going to get blown run out of the gym and honestly, I couldn't have been more encouraged by the offense, especially for three quarters. Uh, that was the offense we thought we'd see all year where Geno Smith had those three weapons and they talked about the emphasis of getting the ball out quick. And Geno had arguably the best game of his career. Uh, JSN, DK, they looked fantastic. You saw the offense, the passing game that we thought we'd see this year. And them going that against Dallas, who's been blowing everyone out, that was really encouraging. And really that's kind of the number one thing I'm going to be looking for moving forward. Uh, defensively, there were some bright moments. They did the held them in some big spots, and you saw some flashes from individual players, but a lot of consistent themes we've been seeing, the issues on third down. And then at the end of the game, we saw some issues that have been is- problems all year, uh, issues with details, issues with execution, the three fourth down plays. And it's been a theme. They 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 should have won that game, in my opinion. Tyler Lockett drops that pass. That was an incredible throw by Gino. The anticipation – and if he kept his feet, that could have been a touchdown. So overall, to answer your question, like I was really encouraged by the offense, especially Geno and the two receivers. It was great to see Abe Lucas back. But the same issues that have plagued them all year, and really they've lost two or three games they should have won. This should be an eight or nine win team. And the reason they lost that game is why they've been losing these games all year and why they're six and six. So some really, really good stuff, obviously, but consistent recurring themes. It's so true. And, and, you know, that's, um, I was on a podcast earlier today and we, we were talking about that. It's like, you know, there, there, there seems to be a bit of a roller coaster feel to this team right now. Now, Nathan, I, I know from our group chat that you are not necessarily in that same headspace, but I have a question for you that I think is, um, it's, 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 I don't know, it, it matters to me. And I, so hopefully it'll matter to you. If Seattle had lost, still lost all the games that they have lost in the last little chunk, if they had played the way they did against Dallas in those losses, would your opinion of the team be any different? I think so, because at least they would have something to 
hang their hat on, right? Um, the offense played extremely well in that Dallas team. Um, they've been a little all over the place. Uh, they've had good offensive performances. They've had good defensive performances, but they've never done things all together or had anything consistently week to week. So if they were showing like, hey, no, we're we're a dominant offense. Like we have problems, but we're a dominant offense. I would feel better about like, at least I would understand their win condition in like every game the rest of the year. Like maybe they, maybe it's going to be a shootout. Maybe they're not, they're going to lose, but I at least understand like, okay, this is how this team will win this week. Right now, I really don't have any idea how they're going to win any given game. Is that just because they've been so inconsistent? Yeah, not that they yeah. can't win any given game. But if you sure. said, okay, what is this? I mean, all right, I know what this Niner game is going to look like. But if you look at the rest of the games, they're like, ah, that Pittsburgh game, what's it going to look like? Man, I have no idea what that Pittsburgh game is going to look like. I I'll hope go. I have an idea what it looks like. <laughs> Fingers crossed, right? Brian, same question. Either either one. That either, you know, I, I, were you encouraged by what we saw from Dallas or against the Dallas game? Uh, same question as to Nathan as Nathan. Would would your opinion be different had they played that well in in the other losses? Yeah, it's a really good question. I feel like there's an encouragement debt that's been built up here where like one game of playing much better than expected against a quality opponent is not enough for me to all of a sudden be encouraged. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was nice to see. I would definitely love to see more of that. And in fact, the biggest thing I'm looking for the rest of this season I think the two biggest things I'm looking for have nothing to do with wins and losses. Okay. Um, number one is whether the offense can look anything close to that the rest of the year. Like, I, I think that is the number one thing I'm interested in. And that's holistic. That's about how the offensive line performs. Abe Lucas had his first game. Is he going to look any better the rest of the season? Charles cross development, offensive line in general, is Gino going to be able to throw it that quickly uh, in other games, stay clean and, create big explosive plays like they did is dk gonna look like a number one receiver is jackson smith and jigba gonna look like uh maybe the best separation receiver on the team and like a clear number two if maybe not the number one target for them like and then you know run game and all that stuff as well but like that's the number one thing that i want to see from this team and so that was a good start like would love to see more Mm -hmm. um And then the number two thing for me is just player development and specific eyes. Like defense is not the second thing on my list. Like performance of the defense is not the second thing on my list, but performance of Devin Witherspoon and Reek Woolen and Trey Brown, performance of, uh, you know, Draymond Jones and Leonard Williams, if he ends up being part of the longer term plans. Uh, Boye Mafe, who has gone on a cold streak after his seven game Mm -hmm. sack streak, like, that's where I'm at. I'm looking for those specific things. And um, people are talking about the playoffs and I like, I, I'm, I'm not quite to the Jim Mora uh, senior level about it, but I just, I, like, that's not, that is not, they could sneak in the playoffs, the nine and eight record or a 10 and seven record or whatever it ends up being. If the other things go poorly, I'm very much with Nathan. This has been one of the least predictable teams, the mm-hmm. Seahawks teams, I can remember in my time being a Seahawks fan. I don't know. From the very first game of the season, from half to half, like series to series sometimes, like I just – I don't know whether this is like sometimes a great defensive team, a great secondary, a great pass rush, terrible secondary, terrible pass rush, you know, great running game, terrible running game, great pass. Like it's like – only thing we have consistently is we have a good punter and a shitty kicker. Like that's the consistency. Oh, Evan's not here to defend. I feel terrible. Oh yeah. That's the best part. <laughs> oh my God. I was so furious when I saw that you missed that. Field. I was just like, Oh, it was crazy. Well, you know, I have to say though, guys, I, I watching this game, like I mentioned, I was actually encouraged. I was like, you know, Dallas is seriously, I know everyone, the media is so fickle, you know, they're the Eagles are the darlings. And then it's, um, you know, now it's the Niners in the NFC and they'll switch again, depending on who beats who, where. Um, but the minute that the Niners thumped the Eagles are like, oh no, the Eagles are trash. We really should pay attention to the 49ers. That's how fickle it is. But it's been interesting to, to kind of see the evolution of, um, 
of this team. And what was encouraging most to me when I was watching this game, especially the second time, because I watched the condensed one and then I went back and watched the whole game. And what was encouraging to me is that they still seem to have some fight in them. And then I said, the interesting thing is I think there's a few people on this team were playing for their jobs. And I'm not talking about coordinators. I'm talking about players. And I feel like we felt a little urgency, especially out of DK um, and a few of the other players. And so I find that that's interesting. Nathan, of all the players, we're going to talk about coaching separately. I have a whole separate segment for that. But, but let's talk about these players. I just really felt like they're, I don't know if it was you know, Witherspoon popping off saying, why aren't we just going after these guys or whatever it was that he said, there, there just seemed to be some players that had a real sense of urgency. DK was the one that really stuck out to me. Yeah. Brooks was going off on the sideline to yeah. the Niners, right? <clears throat> yep. Um, yeah. I, you know, DK is an interesting one. Um, mm-hmm. He came out, he looked good. Uh, he looked like the DK we all know and love. Uh, but like just the, the week before, uh, he, he, yeah, completely mailed that game. Mm-hmm. Um, which I hate to say about a player, like, I really hate to question a player's effort and stuff, but like, you, it's just so hard to look at what he do, did this week compared to the previous week. And like, the situations were different, but like, this, they were down 17 7 at one point in this game, and like, they continued to fight and made it a game and everything. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't know what DK is doing. I hope he's feels like he's fighting for a job or fighting for, you know, mm-hmm. recognition or whatever, because like, he needs to be present for (laughs) all of these games. You can't just have him disappearing against the Niners. Mm -hmm. I think it did shut up a bunch of people though, that were like, Oh, DK actually isn't any very talented. No, he's extremely talented. He just needs to get his shit together every once in a while. Right? Like seriously, it needs to get to the point. I don't, I, I have said in this group and I've said online before that, you know, people are like, we need to trade DK. We need to trade DK. I don't know how you do that because I have a feeling that Tyler Lockett might not be with this team next year to his own volition. It just feels like this year feels like a swan song to me. Jeff, am I completely off base there? I, I just, I don't, I don't feel it from him at all. I don't want to like speculate there, but I know it's hard, right? He, he yeah. He looks different. He, mm-hmm. I know Nathan's done a really good job t- tweeting out clips the last two mm-hmm. games. Like, yeah. And I know watching the film, you can just see, especially the week before he wasn't separating and his deep speed is what he's been so good with over the years just isn't there right now. And he did look a little better in this game, although his drop was devastating, definitely looked better in this game, but a combination of his age, his contracts, his other interests in life. I can't imagine. Like, I know he's put a lot of time into being a realtor. I don't know if that's where he wants to go with his career, but his contract, they did redo his deal a little bit. And it's going to jump up like crazy next year. Uh, just he's not the same player in terms of like deep separation and with what DK's contracts about to shoot up in terms of a cap hit next year, it goes pretty significantly higher. And with JSN emerging and some other guys there, his time, if it's not next year, it's the year after. So I don't, I don't think he'll be back probably next year, but if he is, it's probably his last year. I don't think that's a crazy thought at all. Was there anyone else you thought was kind of fighting for their job? On the field, not on, on the field. field. We got a whole nother. Geno Smith. I think Geno Smith. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of criticism after the San Francisco game about Geno. Like a lot. I sat with Evan in that game and every five minutes he would turn to me and be like, you know, Geno's not that good. Like he's playing like the worst game of this season. I'm like, yeah, thanks, Evan. Like full <laughs> take there. And we need, like, more, we need more Evan impressions from you, Jeff. That was <laughs> that was pretty spot on. That was really good. He kept saying like the most obvious things possible, like it was some genius idea. It was hilarious <laughs> watching the game with him. He was way that doesn't sound like Evan at all. I know, but he is hilarious. Evan was great. Anyway, but Gino, like his job and was a lot being talked about. His future, everyone's Colin Coward came out like they need to replace this guy. See how he's going to trade up. And he had the best game of his season. Defensively, you saw some moments, but going the other way, like Jamal Adams' future uh, is definitely going to be talked about. I'm sure we'll get into that. Uh, (laughs) He's definitely playing his way out of Seattle, not just on and off the field, but Quandre Diggs, same sort of thing. Uh, Those are the two highest players on the defense. Mm -hmm. Um, You saw some good things from Jaron Reed. Jaron Reed played. He was the one who called out the team sort of before the game, and 
he kind of gone cold similar to what Boye had. And he, he really flashed. He really played well. Damian Lewis had his best game of the season. Uh, we need to see more consistency there. He's been completely up and down this year, more down than up. That was the only up game really. And yeah, I have a lot to say on the coaching. So we'll say that. We'll for get now. there. We're going to get, Oh yeah. I have lost. But, yeah. I'd say Gino is the obvious one. Yeah. Can we pause and just talk about Darren Reed a little bit? Like please, <clears throat> he's good. And he's like putting in the work and, I mean, he's been a little bit of a punching bag on this show, and I don't think anyone liked the signing. And just like game in, game out, he's just a really good player for this team. Not amazing, not you know, he's not gonna have ten sacks this year or whatever. Um, but like, the dude is just working his ass off, playing well, making big plays. He's the like the center of this defense. Um, he's been amazing. He's awesome. He should get so much more love for the. With all the other stuff that's happened this season on the field, off the field, all the weirdness, whatever, like that dude has just been there and been reliable and been solid. And I'm thanks, Jaron Reed. You've been a, a real bright spot this year. <laughs> it's true though, right? And because honestly, Brian, none of us expected that. You're like, I remember when he I remember when he was signed, and I was just like ambivalent to it because I didn't know what the hell they were doing anyway. But um, but I know that not everyone was very happy about that. But he's he's Nathan's right, he's kind of become a leader. Yeah, uh, no doubt. I I think he started off stronger and had a little bit of a lull. And I think he's coming back on with Leonard Williams addition. And that's mm -hmm. part of the idea there. Uh, I thought Mario Edwards also outplayed what I expected from him. I thought like I expected nothing from him and I think he's been good. I don't think he's been like, massively great, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to turn it. I'm going to, but I don't want to I'll turn it back to a negative. I just think what? that it's indicative of, Jaron Reed has been good this year. Um, he's not a game-changing player. Like he—he is—he's not someone who other teams have to like design their defense, their offensive scheme around. They don't. I don't think any OC stays up nights trying to figure out how they're going to stop Jaron Reed. And it's been too long where we have these kind of conversations about guys that are like better than we thought or you know but underperformed what we thought or whatever but we can probably count on one hand how many times in the last maybe two hands the last seven years where we've talked about like holy shit this guy this guy's a game changer um and i think dk even qualifies as someone who initially are like this guy could be a game changer. I largely don't think DK has been a game changer the way that I thought he would be. So yeah, I don't know. Um, we need better than Jaron Reed. I'm very happy. He's been positive. If we had a couple of alphas on that defensive line, I think Jaron Reed would be a great rotational part of it. Um, I'm just really, <laughs> I'm very focused on I want these alphas and I'm just going to be a broken record about it um, until we start seeing more of them. No, I think that that's a really good point. And it's actually a really good segue because there's a conversation out there being had about whether or not this is on the players, whether or not this is on the GM, whether or not this is on the coaches for what we're getting out of them. So let's go ahead and spin that conversation because I think it's pretty obvious. I think and I think most of us agree. Um, that, you know, what players we need to see more from or need to see gone, right? Like, I think we've had that conversation a thousand times. But I think what where the conversation needs to go now, though, is to the coaching staff. And I, Jeff, I know you have a lot to say about this, so we'll definitely get there. But um, so what's been interesting is the points have been brought up a lot lately about Pete Carroll. He goes through coordinators, like left and right. He gives them three years, then they're gone. Um, that's what he gave Schottenheimer, who's doing well now. This is what, you know, um, Waldron's third year. Um, Clint Hurdy goes through these DCs um, pretty regularly. What's interesting to me, what I want to know from you guys, and we'll talk about Pete separately, but when you look at these coordinators, is there a common theme between all of them other than Pete Carroll picked them, right? Is is there something there that you don't think that they have in them to get these players to play to the level that we expect? Because honestly, a lot of times we expect these players to play really well, right? And then it just doesn't seem to happen or the scheme is off or the calling is bad or whatever it may be. So other than Pete Carroll, because we'll talk about 
Pete, in a minute, is there a common theme between all these coordinators who never last past two or three years? Jeff, I want to start with you because I know you wanted to talk about them. That's a hard question. I don't know if I see a common theme. Yeah. Um, I think the common theme is more of a bigger picture that Pete has not done a good enough job identifying assistant coaches. And you look at San Francisco in the last few years, and they've identified Mike McDaniel, who's been with Kyle Shanahan for years, now one of the best coaches in the NFL. Uh, D'Amico Ryans, who was developed by Robert Sala. Both of them have become head coaches. Sala's fizzling in New York a little bit. But the offensive coordinator in Houston, uh, Bobby Slowick, that was another San Francisco guy. So that's four coaches in the last couple of years mm -hmm. that are on track to become head coaches. And they've been Seattle over the years. They just ha haven't. And one of the things I've just noticed watching around the league in the last few years, and we've had this conversation offline, is it's really, really hard to find good offensive coordinators. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, even when you do find them, they get hired. So the Lions right now, they've identified this Ben Johnson guy. He's been grown up. He's going to be their tight end coach. He's going to get hired. They're going to have to try to search. They have Baltimore spent like eight years trying to find a the guy. They finally hit on one. Pete has not identified. He's had three or four of them, and none of them strike me as head coaching. Clint Hurt, there's some things to like about him. I don't see him as like an emerging head coach. Carl Scott might be the best guy in the whole coaching staff, and he's still got a long way to go. But I think right now you look around the league and you see all these offensive coordinators come and go, and you see how many few. If you're hiring a head coach in this cycle, there's like two – most of the good OCs become head coaches. Mm -hmm. So I really become radicalized on this idea of having the play calling offensive minded head coach, because you, you that doesn't really answer your question, but you see all the teams that are really good on details. You see the teams that are winning with scheme and you're not in this endless search for these offensive coordinators where defensive coordinators seem to be much more available, much more available to find. So back to your question. No, I don't really mm -hmm. see a consistent theme. I just see more of the same that, Seattle's not identifying these guys that are emerging and they're not building this culture of where guys are growing and growing. Like we've seen in San Francisco and we saw in green Bay with Mike Holmgren and it's just not happening. Nathan, any thoughts on that? You're muted, sweetie. Uh, no, I mean, I think Jeff said it pretty well. I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky spot. And I mean, I, it's hard to have confidence at this point in Pete identifying really top tier, you know, coaching talent, um, whatever kind of common thread that we could find between these guys, like the end result is they've all disappointed, <laughs> yeah. um, at least, you know, since Dan Quinn, um, pretty much every coordinator since then has been, you know, bad to some degree. So, yeah, it's fair. Brian, A, yes. feel free to, to jump in on the coordinators if you want to, but I want to talk to you about Pete a little bit. And the okay. reason I want to talk to you about Pete a little bit is because I know Nathan's thoughts. I have a pretty good idea of what Jeff's thoughts are, and we will share all of them. But we've had the conversation in our group chat about, you know, Pete, where he sits with this team. Now, we obviously know that he's an executive vice president. Also, you know, he has other roles within this team. The conversation have been, is he have too much input and not giving John Snyder enough input? Is he trying to take over too much? Has he been in the game too long? Where do you sit with Pete and kind of where his future lies with this team? It's a big question, and so feel free to break it up. But I just feel like there's there's a lot to talk about there because it either causes all the, the, the Pete lovers to be like, no, 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 keep him, which I understand because we all know how hard it is to have a good head coach. And absolutely get rid of him. He's the oldest coach in the league, which I understand because he is. So it's tough. I think there's more upside in finding a new coach than I think there is in sticking with Pete. Okay. Um, I think the coordinator conversations are good lead into that. You know, given how important that is and how little success he's shown there, the joke I've made that I'll make again is, the old Mike Shanahan Redskins, and it was the Redskins at the time, um, offensive coaching staff was like fish in a barrel to find a next great offensive mind. And he managed to find the one that is not as great as anybody else. And so, I don't know. I, I'm, <laughs> I think Pete brings a ton to the table. I think that the number of head coaches in the NFL that have gotten the effort and the out and like the 
quality performance that the Seahawks showed last week after the way that they've played previous weeks is very low. I think there's very few head coaches that would be capable of turning a team around to play that well, that quickly after the way they've been playing. And I think that matters. So I, I think that it's a huge deal. Um, I've been pointing out that I think that we've talked a lot. It always has been about the coaching and Pete is often the, the, in the line of fire. Mm -hmm. When I look back, I still look at the personnel as being a really major issue. I don't think that I can't point to a lot of players that were that left here and became great somewhere else. Um, I can point to a number of players that were great pretty much right away and picked right after guys that we've played at positions of need that we had. Um, and some, I think, philosophical differences about positional value and where to take players that I think is pretty massive. I think there have been trades that have been really detrimental to this team. I think that is a far bigger storyline than I think a lot of folks talk about. And I don't think you can divorce Pete from that. Mm -hmm. I think that GMs, good GMs work in conjunction with the coaching staff to find the personnel that fits the scheme and what they like and what they're looking for. So I think it's all mixed up. And I, ultimately, ultimately, my answer is we need a new owner. Like I've said that we can't fire the owner as a Mariners fan as well. I wish we could. Like, oh, my God, do I wish we could for the Mariners? um jeff if you guys get otani i hope that you enjoy that um up in toronto anyway i think i think that's where there needs to be that's where i'll really change my belief about the directory of the team short of that um probably pete for sure like try something new i don't have a lot of confidence that that's what's going to happen so i'm much more just eyes on the players that we've got and seeing what, what changes can be made there. I don't know that we're going to see a change at the coaching position, even if this year ends up being, you know, seven and 10 or whatever. I, I just don't see it happening. It's interesting because I will, I, I will admit something that it was hard for me to come to, but this is really the first year where I can start to see a post Pete Carroll Seahawks. And that's not because I'm a Pete Carroll Stan. I've always seen his flaws. I just have always enjoyed the way he has coached this team. And like you said, brings out the best in so many of these players, but it, it's, it's really, it's hard to ignore the fact that the same things are going on over and over and over again, no matter what we do. And so I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm finally kind of settled with it. Had it happened, you know, we go clear back to the Russell pre Russell Wilson trade when he was like, it's me or Pete Carroll. They had gotten rid of Pete and kept Russ. I would have been livid. Like I would, that would have just put me over the edge. And, and slowly over the years, I even loved what we saw it last year. I was like, God, yes, this is what Pete did with freaking Geno Smith, right? Like that was amazing. And, but now I'm like, I'm kind of settling into that thought that maybe it would be okay to go ahead and move on from Pete. The question that then comes up is that, you know, he has this other position, this, you know, um, vice president position. Would it be a way to bow out well easily to just be like, you know, I'm going to release head coach. I'm just going to stay in this personnel, but that still gives him so much power. Like, would there really be much of a change there? I agree with you. We have talked about ownership before um, and whether or not that is something Um that, you know, we have to really kind of look at, I, I think so, because I think while I don't want to go to, what is his name? Tepper, that crazy guy in the Panthers. I don't want to go to that competition level. I feel like a little more competition is there and needs to be there. And so that's interesting. You know, I think that we're all kind of tired of the middle of the road. Um, so it's interesting to me. I, I don't know. Do, do any of you and anyone feel free to answer this, feel that if Pete goes, does Schneider need to go too? Or do we Give him time to see what he can do with a different head coach. Anyone have a strong opinion about that? I don't. I think Schneider is a bigger problem at this point than Pete. Interesting. Is. Tell me why. Well, you know, they extended uh, or they restructured Lockett and Jamal Adams this offseason. And those two guys look, I would, I'm not going to call Adams cooked quite yet, but he ain't the same dude. And like, surprise, surprise, mm -hmm. he has this massive injury and he doesn't quite look the same athletically. Um Tyler's, you know, been <clears throat> physically declining, right? His top end speed 
disappearing is not like a new thing. Uh, his interest, like now maybe Schneider knows something we don't and, and Lockett's going to retire and it's all going to kind of work itself out or something. But I mean, those types of moves are not Pete. Pete's not, Pete may be saying, hey, we got to go make a move for Leonard Williams. And then John needs to figure out, okay, well, we have to fit Leonard Williams in the cap. And John's the one making the decision, well, let's restructure Jamal, mm -hmm. which hurts your ability to cut him down the road. Um, so no, I don't, I think, you know, if, if the main problem, like Brian keeps coming back to like, hey, we need alphas. Hey, we need talent. Hey, we mm -hmm. need players. like the, you know, the Niners have 52 uh, all pros and we don't have any, <laughs> like, I don't think firing Pete fixes that problem for you. And I think, you know, you look at the way Schneider has ran this team, he's done some great stuff and he's pissed away a lot, not just around the margins, right? Like the Leonard Williams thing, I like him as a player, but you traded a second round pick for that. You don't know if he's going to come back. He's older. You know, you, you, you need to build talent on this team. I, I don't know if that was the right thing to do there, like from a team building, per, you know, philosophy perspective. And so um, like there are, I think there are bigger cracks in like Pete Carroll's defense. There's massive cracks in his defense, but to defend Pete Carroll, than even there was a few years ago when he was getting a lot of criticism. Like he he just came out and straight up said twice this year, hey, I didn't have my team ready for divisional rivals. Mm -hmm. uh, three times. Three times. Okay. Yep. Both Rams game and the Niners game. Yeah. Yeah. For what it's worth, as much as I know, like I think Josh Cashman specifically gets very annoyed about that. Um <laughs> I I think when things are going poorly, Pete just throws himself in front of the bus like all the time mm -hmm. to try to take pressure off of other people that's just like his thing so i even though i've i've noted the same thing i do wonder how much of it is just him trying to deflect attention away from all the other people that are screwing up it it just has felt though a little bit more frazzled the last couple of years i think you know even in 2018 like whatever you want to say about that team like they had a purpose and they were prepared and they they were you know they were Wait, can i can I make like the the counter for a second and yes. see where if you guys are where you're on it? So the, the counter is winning in the NFL is hard. Building championship rosters is hard. Yes. Um, they are farther along than most people would have expected them to be relative to where they were when they traded Russell and essentially mm -hmm. kicked off a rebuild, and have had two solid drafts where they've added more quality players um than they had in the previous like probably four or five years combined um and so part of this i think this is where i get sometimes frustrated in the discourse around this is they loaded up it for a three-year roster building window they did okay they did maybe even good but you need to be terrific or you need to hit in specific ways that fits together and have the roster and cap fit in a certain way or position like a quarterback or something hit in a certain way and it didn't happen and so i'm not totally sure that you bring in another set of folks and it would have gone any better the last two years it might probably my guess is it would have gone worse um and so part of it is just the realization as much as it sucks is yep we rolled and we didn't get yahtzee um, and so we got to go back to the you know drawing board and, and roll again. And this is so hard. It's so hard to do in the NFL. A hundred percent. I I don't. I have to discount the draft stuff a tiny bit. Not even a tiny bit for John. Like we would have basically drafted the exact like we as in like everyone here. Like we would have taken the, uh, Carter over Witherspoon probably, and that would have worked out just fine. And so you know, but like Witherspoon was expected to be a top 10 pick. He was expected to go in that range. He would have, he would have gone sixth. Yeah, right. He would have been next. Absolutely. No, he would have, uh, that's, I can know, I tell you that for a fact. We were all screaming to draft JSN, right? We were all, we all yeah, wanted them to draft one of the three tackles last year. Like Boye Mafe was picked like probably right where every mock draft had him going, and, you know, within a couple picks or so. Abe Lucas was another guy that a lot of people thought was the second round pick. They get him in the third. So, you know, I, I, 
we're not that far removed from Dwayne Eskridge over Creed Humphrey, right? <laughs> now, maybe maybe approach has changed. It feels like clearly there's been some change in approach. Like John's looking at the PFF draft board and just picking off of that, which great, it's an improvement. But like, also, you know, he's had top ten picks and he he's had some stuff teed up for him the last couple of years in the draft. Jeff, you wanted to say something. Well, I don't disagree with what Brian's saying. I think they they are what I thought they were about to like be terrible for the next few years and they're further along than I would have guessed at this point. However, the one thing that I keep seeing and we talked about it before was how unpredictable they are and how bad they are on details and how the situational management. The whole thing is you guys can't predict what's going to happen and that has to be a reflection of coaching. Mm-hmm. And I watched the Colts play last week. We have a backup quarterback, Jonathan Taylor's out. And Shane Steichen, who was a guy the Seahawks actually were linked to when one of the when Shoddy got fired, that team looks smart. They look well organized. They look, and they've I think they're in the playoffs with Gardner Minshew, Brian's guy. Uh, but I see some of these coaches and some of the Zach Taylor one the other night, Jake Browning. I could uh, team that what was the hell was that game? <laughs> So that has to do with coaching. I would take Jake Browning over Drew Locke any day. And I would have said that before that game, by the way. But, like, the one thing you guys said earlier in the show is we have no predictability of what this team's going to be. That, to me, is coaching. The lack of detail. Okay. The situational awareness. Like, that game on the line, your play's designed for DJ Dallas. It brought back Ricardo Lockett moments. It's like there's themes here year after year after year. And I sort of trend towards Nathan where – John has done a good job, and he's done a lot of good things. The Chen Nuosu signing was a fantastic. A lot of their personnel has been better. But I look at a team, and I see themes, and I don't know if this is Pete or John. This is where it's so hard, but it's been 10, 12 years they haven't invested in offensive line correctly, in it. and that's clearly a theme. Either they're not investing it correctly, and Brian, we've talked about center year after year after year. No better thing represents this regime than taking a third receiver that's a gadget player over an all-pro center. Um, we look at where their money is spent. The Eagles don't spend money on safety. It's their thing. Seattle's spending, what, $50 million next year on safety? Linebackers are not being paid. Bobby Wagner was making $19 million a couple of years ago. There are themes in the league that are happening. It's offensive-driven leaders, scheme leaders. Offensive lines are really, really good. And Seattle is just not investing that way. They're investing differently. They're not. How many years do we say, okay, where? who's our p- primary pass rusher? And they have invested better the last two years. And I would like to see John at some point get to identify his own coach. But it's been so long. They're sort of tied together at this point. I think if John got fired, he'd be hired very, very quickly. He'd be get a job. His perception around the league is amazing. But at some point, I think it's time to just put new two. It's hard to see them keeping one without the other. Interesting. Yeah, it might be. All right, let's go ahead and get to page rank questions because there's quite a few. So thank everyone. Of course, we will do our Patreon plug. <laughs> so everyone go to patreon.com slash hog blogger, join, you will get immediate access to the Slack channel. And then you get to ask us these questions, which I'm going to go ahead and read now because I just can't let Nathan do it. I'm sorry. I just have to do it myself. Just kidding. That's okay. I I didn't have it pulled up. I was panicking. Okay. I got you. No worries. All right. So let's go ahead and start with the first one. And um, Nathan, I'm actually going to give this one to you because I think you'll have the best answer. This is from, is it Callian? Um, Will any one of you be surprised if the Hawks finish 6 and 11? Yes, I will be surprised. Uh, The tight... Now, if they only win one more game, that won't be shocking to me. But to lose, no, I'm not saying I'm predicting that. But uh, if they, the Titans, the Steelers, the Cardinals, losing all three of those, like barring, you know, a Geno injury or something, that seems very unlikely to, to whiff on all three of those. Yeah, I, it would shock me. I, in fact, I expect them. You guys are going to think I'm Paula Annieing this, but I expect them to win one of the next two. After watching that Eagles game, I'm thinking that one might be in play a little bit, or this Niners game could end up being a trap game. I have positivity. It could happen. But I would be real surprised if they didn't win two or three of their last three. Anyone think different? Nope. Okay. Let's go ahead to the next one. never lost four in a row in 
think he's about to do that, right? No, they're going to. <laughs> Keep the faith. Okay, so the next one. Okay, so let's just get into this Jamal Adams. There's three or four questions about Jamal Adams, and no one's going to like my answer. But this is from Has No Clue. Is it overreacting to say Jamal Adams shouldn't be on the team anymore? Or is there a big issue at Pete's level with these type of issues happening, such as DK previously with his penalties? They keep having issues after games, essentially saying they weren't prepared. Seems like there's a bigger issue happening at leadership. So let's stick with the Jamal Adams thing first. Does anyone think Jamal Adams should be kicked off the team right now? Because that's a big theme on Twitter today. No, I don't think he needs to be kicked off the team. I mean, he's clearly being an ass right now, but uh, we've we've seen players behave much worse on this team and not get cut. What, the entire season. LOB minus Camp Chancellor. <laughs> yeah, and much much darker stuff too. Uh, yeah, so yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, my thought is everyone's clutching their pearls over this. Okay, first of all. You guys wouldn't believe the names that I get called daily on from football fans. So, you know, I, I I don't think much of him, you know, going back and forth with the media member. But secondly, to be honest with you, right now the Bills are dealing with, you know, Von Miller. Let, let, let's let not forget what we're talking. We're talking about two people in a pissing match on Twitter. So everyone just needs to calm down. He's being an asshole. Yes. But I don't think it's anything to get too. Just calm down, people. It's not worth it. Okay. So. But then the question that I think has a little more validity, and Jeff, I'm going to hand this to you. Is it Pete's style, as we all know, to let these players go and let them have their personalities and let them be who they are, even though he did talk to Jamal about this, apparently? Is that getting in the way of their performance, letting them be too big, not reining them in, not Bill Belichicking them enough? Do you feel like that's part of the issue or is that a positive or a negative for the team? It's who Pete is. Unfortunately, he creates a culture where people are allowed to be themselves. We saw it with Richard Sherman towards the end of his Seahawks tenure, where he went at Daryl Bevel and he called the team out for the running the ball or passing the ball at the one yard line again. And we saw it earlier this year with DK and the penalties, and they discounted some of the stuff Pete said to him. And he said, I'm going to be me. And now Jamal essentially is double down and wanting to do it again. So I don't think it's Pete's style to come in the way and rein them back. It's just not who he is. It's not what he's about. And he wants these guys to feel like they can be themselves. In this case, I think he might, he maybe should have. His, mess, his messaging is not stop doing this. It's, I don't know what his message is, but mm-hmm. I don't think what Jamal did was appropriate. I think he should have been punished for that. And it's a bad look when DK kind of scoffs at, oh, yeah, Pete put me through this meeting, whatever. I'm just be who I am. They put up this penalty board. It's, there's issues now, and it does impact the team. And Jamal does a bunch of things where, like, It'll be first and 10. He'll go up seven yards. He'll tackle a guy three yards short, and then he'll start dancing in their face and screaming. And It's just – I don't want to call it like fake tough guy because I have a lot of respect for him, and he's put himself through a lot to get back on the field. But there's this energy right now about him, about the team. And it is one of the issues I do have with Pete. It's just this stuff – at times you need to be disciplined. And so much of what happened with the team sort of breaking apart was Pete kind of babied Russell and – funny enough, Russell ended up in him and ended up beefing in their own way, but there needs to be more of a disciplinarian in there, and I think players get away with a little too much here. Uh, just seeing that the Seahawks didn't really have a response to this, Pete's like, yeah, we handled it, and then he comes out and completely looks like an ass again, and I don't think it's a positive or negative. It's who Pete is, but when they're losing and things are – they're going to lose again on Sunday, I'm sorry. Um we're going to see who's mature. Like Bobby Wagner would never do that. Bobby up for Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. I don't want to compare anyone to Bobby. He's like the ultimate professional. Mm-hmm. But it's just a bad look. And all the things that are going wrong with the team, I don't think this helps Pete's case, to be honest. Yeah. I just think it's just noise. I, I Maybe that's not a popular opinion, but, but I'm what happened to ignore the noise? Who cares? You know? Yeah. Just just who cares? And, uh, and you know, I think, think that so, if, though, when you bring someone's wife into this, yeah, it was tacky. I, I totally get it. Yeah. Now, there's apparently a huge history between them. And so we haven't heard all of that, him and the entire New York media. And so whatever. Jamal is who he is. At the same time, I just think that, you know, really in light of Deshaun Watson and all of these other things that are out there, really, this is what you're pissing and moaning about right now, guys. Just it, It's just I, I think I think the fair thing is just 
if you didn't lose a little bit of respect for Jamal through this whole process, whether it's the way he responded back to the reporter it was or the fact that he said when people go low, he's going to go lower. I mean, he's been a guy I've defended a lot, and I don't respect the way he's handled this at all. And I don't respect the fact that he's taking focus away from the team during a time when the team's really the not playing well and and like that's not the kind of leadership i'd expect from someone that's getting paid what he's getting paid especially so um ultimately pete's style works really well when you have great talent and he's able to create an environment where they really feel themselves and are able to like be alphas Mm -hmm. like that's part of what he creates you take the cost with it in those situations when you've got guys that are betas and acting like alphas, then it just comes across as tinny. And, yeah. and it just that like, I don't care if you think you're tough or if you win a Twitter battle, win a fucking game on Sunday, right? Like right. make a play on Sunday. Then, then like, then I'll care more about the rest of mm-hmm. the stuff. I guess that is my point. My whole point is I don't give a shit. If he argues with people on Twitter, I want him to play better on the field. Like that's, he needs to play better there. Yes. What he did was, it was mean. It was tacky. He's definitely not Michelle Obama who goes high, right? Like that's not what we expect from Jamal. But at the same time, I don't think that means that you, you know, he needs to lose his job over something as silly as this. That's my whole point. Was it bad? It was bad. And then to, double down was the absolute worst, but I'm more worried about how badly he's been playing on the field and how I want more from him out of there. That's just my whole point. So, all right. So let's move on. Um, This is from Eric. It says, and Brian, I'm going to send this one to you. Are we being too harsh in our assessment of the team, given the large quantity of young talent that are playing critical roles on the team? As much as I wished at the beginning of the season that all of this talent would come together and work, it doesn't sometimes. It takes time to build chemistry. Um, I... I don't think we're being too hard on on the team because I do think there's enough talent for them to be like you can't look at the way they played against Dallas and say on offense and say oh yeah like they're lacking talent to be able to play high level offense. I just don't buy it. And so they do have talent there. I think the offensive line is a legitimate thing that's been in the way. That to me more than the young player part of this is okay. like a legitimate thing to ask about. But, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I do think that, I, like what I've compared this to is like the 2002 Seahawks. It was a seven and nine season and Trent Dilfer was starting and then he got hurt and Matt Hasselbeck got came off the bench And for the back half of that season, all of a sudden they had like a string of 400 yard plus games, a string of like 500 yard plus games. Uh, Matt Hasselbeck became, uh, you know, a much better quarterback. The offense really took off. Corin Robinson found his place and that ultimately saved Mike Holmgren's job. He was going to get fired for both positions. He ended up getting fired as a GM and getting uh, retained as a coach. And that team didn't go on to win the Super Bowl the next year or the year after. Frankly, they didn't do it the year after, but they made it. Um, But they had established a core. And so what Nathan started the show with, they haven't figured that out yet. And so if they can finish this season with this offense, including Geno Smith, I think it's an important part of the calculation. If it can look like, actually, no, this is a group that they can play with for the next couple of years, at least from the quarterback perspective that would be a pretty positive outcome. Um, I would actually go as far as to say I would take a non-playoff Seahawks team that ends the season with a clear offensive identity that's clearly on the upswing, that's maximizing their players, to a team that made the playoffs, won a game against some shitty opponent, and like didn't clearly add like uh, an identity that was building towards something meaningful. And I think that the the latter is actually was possible. And the former I still think is possible. So um, that's my, my kind of perspective on it. Mm-hmm. It's good. 
Um, so there's a couple questions here. One from Derek. It says, what are the realistic options for Jamal Adams not playing for us next year? Um, I think that that is a cap question that probably we should wait until we have Evan on. Um, cause I know that he usually does that cap stuff. Um, Troy, um, says credit to Jeff Simmons and Rob Statton. Jeff, you have to find out why he has me blocked. So, um, it says, is Pete Carroll's culture overrated? I think that we've already talked about that, that you guys had had talked about that on a podcast earlier. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? So Rob was trying to make the point that basically the Jamal thing, a lot of the issues that have happened, they've identified some players that haven't worked out. So he was making the case that we talk about Pete and the culture he brings. And then he mentioned like eight things that have happened. So he's like, how good is this culture really? And I thought it was an interesting point, but I, I talked about like, there's this one idea that culture is everything and, is one way. I don't think there's one way of looking at culture. I think what Pete does is really unique. Mm -hmm. I think Pete's best skill is performance. I think he can instill confidence in people at a level that is higher than a lot of other coaches. I think Pete can take a player and Brian talked about before with alphas when he had the best team in the league and the best rosters, Pete did it at USC, did it with Seattle earlier. And we've seen him do it with Gino and Russ. He has a way of instilling confidence and he has a way of making work fun. And people love coming here. It works in a lot of businesses. But in Seattle, it has helped. But to me, culture is about winning. And the team just hasn't won enough. And mm -hmm. if it wasn't for Green Bay losing that game to Detroit, now it would be three years. I don't think they're going to make the playoffs this year. It's It would be three years in a row of essentially not making the playoffs. And that's damning. And they can have all the culture they want, but it's a results business. And I think Rob was really trying to hammer that we overrate the value of culture because the, they're not winning enough. I do see things that Pete does Monday through Saturday and even on Sunday that is really elite. And most businesses established, you saw like Josh McDaniels, what he did in two different franchises where he comes in, he's got the offensive mind, he's got the scheme, but he loses the room. So what Pete does is elite in that sense, but I don't think there's this all encompassing idea of culture. I think what Pete does works really, really well, but Again, we Brian talked before. There is downside, and that that's part of the deal. That's yeah, right. I don't think culture is what's driving Bill Belichick to success. <clears throat> like the guy is clearly a, a, like a genius in terms of football terms, and he had Tom Brady. But you look at all what you look at what he's doing right now, and then you look at all of these guys: Matt Patricia, Josh McDaniels, all these hard asses that come in, and they're they 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 don't have any respect from their team either, right? Mm -hmm. Like. I think it's really concerning that Pete said we talked about it and then Jamal said, oh, yeah, he made me listen to him. But now I'm going to spout off about all this stuff that I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. anyways. That's not a great sign. But I don't think Pete coming in and just like cracking down on DK is going to fix DK. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to fix Jamal. I mean, it's probably just going to create more problems. Should Pete be so like accepting of guys that have this strong personality? Yeah, I mean, maybe you can debate about that. But like the idea that, oh, he lets them be themselves and that's a problem. I, I don't buy that even a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, we're going to, we have a lot of questions. We're not going to get to them all. You guys, I'm so sorry about that. But let's go ahead and look at, um, uh, Nathan, I'm going to give this one to you. It's from Zach. Was the complexity of the LOB's in-game adjustments due to the players deviating from Pete's vanilla defense on their own or something else? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, I yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, were, did they have especially complex adjustments? I don't, I think that's a false premise. I think so. I think they were just so dominant. People assumed that to be honest with you. If, if anything, if anything, I would credit that. I do think that they were better. It, 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 it's hard to remember this, but it was pretty typical back then that they would go into halftime, make adjustments, and mm -hmm. the defense would play better. I don't think they were complex. But I do think that I attribute that to two things. Primarily, I do think Dan Quinn was a much better DC X's and O's wise than anyone else that we've had on staff. Mm -hmm. And so I think he was making adjustments. And two, we had freaking like generational talent. So uh, you could tell them, do this or focus on that and or they're coaching each other on it as well richard sherman would probably be the best defensive backs coach we've ever had so anyway i i think it's both um but i don't think they were complex necessarily adjustments okay um so our very own josh cashman added a question into skip 
Skip. I don't know where he's skipping. Josh, we're going to answer that in chat. You don't need to know that. No, no, I want to. Was it about? Where is it? That's all. Yeah, yeah. He wants right. to know what how many starters are going to be gone at the end of the season. He's being snarky. Oh, okay, that'd be fun. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting. It is a good question. It is a good question. I was going through over the cap during our show and cutting people just to make myself feel better. <laughs> Brian could be the next GM. <laughs> I don't want to work those hours, um, but I. <laughs> I would be happy to make some of the choices. I, I really would. Um, I I think five. I'm just going to throw a number out there. Five total? Five That's total. Could be. I mean, I was cutting. Uh, there's so much dead cap that's going to come with this, but you still save cap. I don't know if it ends up making sense, but like Jamal Quandre, Will Disley. Um, we already know that Colby Parkinson and Noah Fant are going to be free agents. I don't know if their person is counting free agents. Josh is the person. Um, I don't think either one of them, Colby might be back, but, uh, I think, uh, on defense, um, or Damian sorry, uh, right. Who else am I missing? Damian Lewis. Oh, Jordan Brooks. I don't know if he'll be back. Questionable about yeah, either Bobby of the Wagner. Yeah, I don't think either of the guards will be back. Phil Haynes, yeah. I don't think Lewis will um, be signed. Jason yeah, Myers. Right. You guys are going to give people a heart attack. <laughs> Jason Myers would be fine with me. In fact, that was one of I the wish, questions. but it would actually, we, we would lose cap space yeah. by cutting Jason no, Myers because that's Good. another. Nick Ballor will be gone. Uh, uh, Dwayne Eskridge right. will be gone. I don't know if Bobby will. We might be past uh, starters if we're talking about Nick Lauren. Yeah, that. fair. Yeah. <laughs> starters on special teams. Well, what about Bobby? Will he be back? No. I, that's up to Bobby. I mean, Bobby's doing one-year contracts because he wants to see how long he wants to play. And to be honest with you, I mean, I think if he wanted to come back and gave him the right price, why wouldn't they? You know, he's a he's, great leader. Look what he's already done on the team. He's awful. He is yes, awful. but he could be rotational, Nathan. He doesn't have to. None be. of you said. None of you said Geno Smith. I think they keep. I think he'll be back. I I would redo his deal, but I think he'll be back. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. So there you go, Josh. I hope you're happy. Um, Let's see. We have one. This one is. We should actually get into predictions. We're. we're, Yes. Well, this one was specific for you. It's a one word answer. So it's easy for you, Brian. It says, for Brian, if only one team could be sold, would you rather it were the Mariners or the Seahawks? Oh, Mariners, for sure. Okay. For sure. Yeah. All right, guys, let's go ahead and talk about this game for a little bit. Our last Patreon question actually is a good one about the 49ers. It wants to know if you still think Seattle could possibly win. What was the one major adjustment? And, And to be honest with you, I think if we see the offense that we saw last week, they probably won't win, but they would have a it would be a good fighting champ. Well, the Niners are just rolling right now. We all admit that, right? We all know that they're just in there. They're in the zone right now. But holy cow, what a game that might end up being. So let's go ahead and get into these predictions. Jeff, I know you think they're going to lose, but how bad do you think they're going to lose? Uh, I hate how much, how good I think this Niners team is. I hate it. It's, they're good. Uh, they're, they just blew the doors off Philly last week. Uh, I think they're going to win by 20 points. Uh, I just, yeah, I just don't think Seattle can block them or stop them. And like we saw what Dak did to these guys, and Kyle's just at a much higher level. So I, I think they win 38 to uh, 17. Interesting. Nathan? 24 mm, 6. <laughs> six. Even after what you saw last week, you think six. I, the the last Niner game wasn't that long ago, so. Um, <laughs> but they won't I I, I'm so confused how you think Jason Myers is going to make two field goals. Well, you know he'll miss three, but so uh, miss the extra point, maybe. No, no, I am not predicting them to score a touchdown. I mean, <laughs> okay, okay. Good the lord, the offense did not score a touchdown the last time they played the 49ers. That's fair. The defense scored more points than the offense. It's oh true. my god. So here's here's the thing. You guys are killing me. Um, which defense in the NFL has played Brock pretty best this year, or like one of the best? Cleveland. Cleveland. The, the Cleveland and the Seahawks. <laughs> oh, fair. The yeah. Seahawks. The Seahawks played one of like limited Brock Purdy more than almost any other team in the last two months, at least. 
uh, it, especially with Trent Williams there, which Cleveland did not have to face for a lot of that game. Um, and without Debo Samuel in the Cleveland game, which they had him for this, the Seahawks game. So uh, the Seahawks also limited George Kittle more than almost any other team. They landed limited Brandon Ayuk more than almost any other team. So, and they, you know, scored a touchdown in that game. Uh, I think that a big part of what was uh, absolutely awful in that game was the offense and how they were able to, you know, they just, they were just terrible in that game. Um, and I think Jeff's right. A lot of that was about how they were able to block up front. Abe Lucas wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm curious if that makes any difference whatsoever. Uh, the 49ers are going to be without Eric Armstead. He's going to be out for a couple of weeks. Um, they're going to be without a couple of other guys uh, on the offensive line, uh, Ross Dwelly at tight end. I don't know how much any of that will matter. I think this one's going to be tighter. I think it's going to be tighter. I want to I'm, – I'm going to predict the Seahawks win because fuck the 49ers forever and always. Um, but you can tell how confident I am in that prediction. So, like – I'll give the Seahawks a a 27-21 victory over the 49ers just to piss in their punch. I have to fact fact check you a little bit here, Brian, because first of all, the Vikings definitely played pretty better than Oh, I forgot about that game. And your boy, Sean McVay, his defense stepped up and played pretty better than uh, Seattle's. Uh, defensive mastermind, Sean McVay, outdueling. But based on what metric, though, you're probably doing EPA or something like that. No, like yards. <laughs> well, Seattle also gave them a lot of short fields, so they didn't do that much. Dallas yards. fumbled, you know, threw that yeah. interception. They couldn't stop McCaffrey. Yes. I don't know, you guys. I I feel like last week showed me that this team still has a little fight in it, and I don't think that they're – I, I don't think they're going to win. It kills me to say that, but I, because I feel much like the about the Niners, like Brian does, that you never predict a loss. But at the same time, I think that they got a little of their mojo on 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 offense back. And we have to remember who Dallas is. To be honest with you, Dak Prescott's the best quarterback in the league right now. And there's a Purdy MVP bullshit is just bullshit. It just makes me so mad. He's not even the best player on his own damn team, let alone in the league. You can't you tell me that Tyreek Hill isn't at least above Brock. I mean, anyway, don't get me started. So, because I'll go off. It pissed me off so bad. So many people but, were in the extra. I know. The thing of it is, is this. I feel like they, like I said, they got a little of their mojo back on offense. I think that this team is is pissed off and embarrassed, and as they should be, as we all agree. But I still don't think they'll have quite enough to win there, but I think it's going to be much closer. I think it's a five to seven point win. Um, I it could be a last minute thing because this team really seems to die off in the in the fourth quarter, right? Like the the whole you know fourth quarter surge that we used to get out of Pete Carroll's teams, we don't get that anymore. And forever we were blaming you know the offense keeps the defense on the field for too long. Well, that sure as hell didn't happen this last game. So what happened there, right? And so I think that that's. I, I just, I don't know. They just seem, maybe they're old. They're not old, but you know what I'm saying. So I think it's going to be a closer game. I think it's going to be a 24-27 win is what I'm going to go with for San Francisco. I, I do think that they'll win. But all eyes are on that Philadelphia game now. I am I am so encouraged after the way they played Dallas and then Philly has to play Dallas this week. I think that we're going to start to see some cracks there. I'm I'm excited about that game. Mostly I, because I adore Jason Kelsey too, but I I really I, I'm, I'm with excited. you. I, I think we can beat Philly. I think Philly, we, Philly's in trouble. I hate that talk. I hate it. I'm telling you, look at for a second. The biggest the biggest outcome for the Seahawks the rest of the season is if they can beat the 49ers and fuck up their home field advantage, and then lose to the Eagles and further fuck up their home. That would field be amazing. So, that is a better outcome. <laughs> I, I, I I agree a thousand percent. I just don't know that it's going to happen. We'll see. But again, uh, this is this is I our think. Super Bowl, folks. This is our Super Bowl. <laughs> oh boy! Find a way. This is like the closest we're going to be to the Super. We're playing a Super Bowl team this weekend. <laughs> so let's pick and meet them. It's the Super Bowl Find team of the week until the media decides it's somebody just, else. Can we sure. not run these long developing deep shots this week? 
Well, that's the thing. We, Please. for the first time, saw quick developing plays mm-hmm. when who got involved in the offense? Pete Carroll. <laughs> Offensive mastermind, Pete Carroll, like, said, involve the tight ends, quicker passes. Please. Need to utilize Jackson Smith and Jigba more. We and did see three tight ends. He's going to get involved with third down plays. All of a sudden, we're like, money. So I think I think we found the answer is that Pete needs to actually have a clipboard, call the plays. I think it'll be friggin' hilarious. Walter, you can just wait in the locker room. You're good. I'm just going to do this myself. <laughs> yeah. That would be hilarious. Oh, I don't know. And yet, people still love Shane Waldron. I don't get it. All right. Brian, I think that's our show. Thank you, Dana, for taking over hosting duties this week. My voice appreciated it. Um, thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thanks to Nathan Ernst at Nathan11, uh, Jeff Simmons at Real Jeff Simmons, and of course, Dana O'Gorman, our host at Dana OG. You can find me, Brian M. Hauser, at Hawk Blogger on Twitter. And if you haven't already, give the show a like. Uh, go to patreon.com slash Hawk Blogger. Sign up. Get access to the Slack channel where we will celebrate and commiserate a little bit more of the latter lately. Hopefully a little bit more of the former the rest of the way. Cheers to all of you. Have a great rest of your night. Go Hawks. <laughs>